and let's get started. Good morning, everyone, and good afternoon, good evening, good night all over the world. Welcome to the fifth day of the Romanian Global Quantum and AI program. This week, we'll focus on quantum hardware and on quantum annealing. Today, we have Daniel Slichter with, with us here from NIST, giving an introduction to quantum hardware. And then that will be followed by various talks on quantum annealing by D-Wave, by Q-World. We will also have a talk on Wednesday by XPRIZE about winning 5 million in three years for quantum algorithms for real-world applications to solve real-world problems. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Daniel Slichter from NIST. Daniel Slichter is a staff physicist in the ion storage group at NIST Boulder. His research focuses on quantum information experiments with threat atomic ions, with an emphasis on developing new paradigms for scalable threat ion quantum computing. He is the perfect lecturer for today because he is not only an expert in threat ion quantum computing, but he also used to work in superconducting quantum information. And he actually performed there the first continuous high fidelity measurement of a superconducting qubit. We are really excited to have you here, Daniel. Could you share a little bit about NIST as well, the place where Dave Vineland won the Nobel Prize for threat ion compu quantum computing and more, and where a lot of the start for quantum information science has been happening? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, thanks for having me. I'm glad that uh, uh, I'm able to be here and talking to everyone today. Um, yes, and, and NIST is uh, short for, as you can see in the corner of my slide, the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Uh, we're an agency in the U.S. Department of Commerce, and our job is to support U.S. industry uh, by producing standards of various sorts uh, and by developing technology to sort of help move science forward and, and standards forward. Um, NIST does a wide variety of different scientific research, as well as applied uh uh, sort of applying that research to uh, producing standards and measurement that are used by uh, companies all over the world. Uh, for example, I work in the time and frequency division, as does Marlu. We're in charge of keeping time for the entire nation. So every time you uh, get time on your phone or something like that, that's eventually coming back from NIST here. Fantastic. And then we're excited for your keynote today, Intro to Quantum Computing Hardware. Please take it away. And uh, questions are most welcome from everyone on Discord, and I will field them to Daniel after the talk. Great. Well, thanks again, Marlou. So um, I'm going to talk to you today intro about an introduction to quantum computing hardware. And it's really going to be an introduction because this, this is a subject that could be many books worth if you really wanted to go deep into it. So the idea today is to just give you a little bit of a flavor. So we talked about quantum computing and you may know about qubits and things like that. But what does this actually look like if you're trying to do something in the lab? Um, so uh, so we'll get started, uh, and I will try and cover uh, a variety of different uh, hardware platforms that exist today. So um, first of all, before we start talking about qubits, let's talk about um, bits, classical bits, or non-quantum bits. So a bit is just a system with two possible states. It's a, it's a switch that could be on or off, and you could call that one or zero, right? And um, when you have digital information, anything in your phone or on your computer or something like that, all that information is encoded and it's processed as a long string of bits. There might be a bunch of zeros and ones like this that could represent a little bit of video or of an image or of some song that you're streaming. Uh, it could be a Word document. It could be a presentation of some sort. But basically all the information is encoded as these bits. And we'll call these classical bits to distinguish them from, from quantum or qubits. Now, something I wanna point out is that bits, you may not think about this, there are lots of different physical forms that you can take for bits. Uh, well, one thing is you could have, if you have a processor, for example, a bit could re be represented by a transistor that has an output voltage, and that might be a high voltage or a low voltage, and that gives you sort of a one or a zero, right? But it could also be, if you if you have a hard drive, it could be a little tiny magnetic domain on that hard drive. And depending on whether the little magnet is pointing up or down, that is what, what determines your bits. 
Um, the fact that you're able to hear me right now uh, is down to the fact that we encode bits as pulses of lights in optical fiber. Basically, everything in the internet uh, comes down to running light through optical fibers like this and having the light be on or off um, is another way of encoding uh, a bit. Uh, similarly, um, there's probably for that last mile for most of you, a lot of you are on Wi-Fi. And so basically this is a, basically a radio signal, a microwave signal uh, that's uh, being turned on and off very rapidly, effectively. It's a bit of a simplification for some of these things, but the idea is that all of these are different physical ways in which you can represent bits. And each one of these different physical ways of, of encoding a bit has strengths. It has weaknesses, and, and so as a result, there's sort of things that we primarily use them for and things that we don't. We'll use fibers for communication. We'll use hard drives for storage. Um, it would be weird to use hard drives for communication, but you could do it. It would be weird to use fibers for storage. Maybe you could do that. But the point is to think about the fact that even with classical bits, there's many ways that we realize them, and there's many um, strengths and weaknesses. So now we're gonna talk about quantum bits or qubits. And a qubit is just a quantum system that has two possible states. It's again, like this switch, but it's it's quantum mechanical. So the sort of the, the example you always see in a textbook would be uh, an electron with a spin one half in a magnetic field. And this has two states with the spin either along the magnetic field or, or in the opposite direction. And, uh, and those two states have two different energies. And, and with that, you formed a, a qubit. Um, but you could also form a qubit from states of something, an atom or something that's sort of atom-like, um, a defect in a solid, for example. Um, you could form a qubit from the states of some kind of macroscopic object like a, a circuit. Uh, a superconducting circuit like this uh, can actually be used to encode a bit qubit, and we'll talk about that. Um, you can also use photons, which are particles of light, uh, and you can encode qubits in their polarization or their arrival time or things like this. Um, and so, uh, and, and or, or basically in particular unusual non-classical patterns of them. So the idea is, again, as with classical bits, there's many ways that we can realize qubits, and they all have different pros and cons. And so I'm going to talk a little bit today about what these things are and, um, and how we might realize them in the lab. So um, let's just quickly remind ourselves why qubits are different from regular bits. Uh, one way in which qubits are different than regular bits is what we call superposition. And that's the idea that if you have a quantum state uh, of the qubit, it doesn't have to be in just one or the other. It doesn't have to be just off or on. It can be sort of in both at the same time. And we represent that superposition here with these, these complex numbers A and B that we call amplitudes, quantum amplitudes that multiply the two states. So you can be in more than one state at once. And actually, if you have more than one qubit, if you have n qubits, then there are two to the n possible states. And you can be in multiple of those, including all two to the n at the same time, if you want to. So um, this is one of the important weird things about quantum mechanics uh, that sets it apart and sets qubits apart. Qubits are able to be in superposition. Now, the uh, superposition obviously doesn't, doesn't last always because when you look at this, if you take your qubit and you connect it to some sign of a classical meter uh, that will allow you to measure the quantum state of this qubit, um, the classical meter isn't going to tell you zero and one at the same time. We, we have the experience in our everyday lives that things aren't both at the same time uh, like uh, as, a, as a quantum mechanical system would be. Uh, so what actually happens is when you measure Measure, you actually change the state of the qubit. If the meter reads one, the qubit actually changes to the state one. If the meter reads zero, the qubit actually changes to the state zero. Uh, and there's some probability that it will pick this one or that one, depending on what these quantum amplitudes are here. And so the idea, we call this measurement projection. We say that the measurement process projects the qubit state and forces it basically out of the superposition. It destroys the superposition and it makes the qubit choose being one or zero, and then it reports back the answer. So this quantum measurement is another sort of key quantum feature that's not, uh, not something that we see in, in our everyday lives. A third feature of quantum systems is interference. So if you have different quantum amplitudes like this on different states, they can actually add or subtract. 
And they can add or subtract in certain ways that, for example, these two waves adding here add up to make a bigger wave. But these two waves that are out of phase, if you add them up, basically make nothing happen. And so this is what we call constructive interference and destructive interference. And I'm just sketching these out very schematically. But the idea is that when you have quantum states with these amplitudes and you cause them to interact with each other, it can make some amplitudes get bigger and some amplitudes get smaller or even go away, which is an essential feature of quantum algorithms. Finally, we have in quantum mechanics what we call entanglement. And this is the idea that let, let's say you have two qubits here. Uh, you can be in a superposition state, and you might have a superposition state like this one here that I've drawn, 0, 0, plus 1, 1. And the idea is that a superposition like this is inherently correlated. So if you actually go and do a measurement of one of these qubits, then that measurement will impact what the other qubit's state is. And so there's a way in which the state of this and the state of that qubit can't be thought of as being independent of each other. Well, if you do something to one, that's going to effectively force the other one to, uh, to have something to happen to it, too. And that's true if they're nearby or even if they're at opposite ends of the universe, if they're entangled. So this is one of the, the features of, of quantum mechanics that feels very counterintuitive to us in our everyday experience. So we've got these qubits. What do we need to actually perform quantum computing with these qubits? Um, and this is, I'm going to give a summary, which was first sort of like written down in this nice form by, by David DiVincenzo. And these are sort of sometimes called DiVincenzo criteria. So if you want to have a quantum computer, you need to have an input where you have enough qubits, n qubits, and n could be large, depending on what we're trying to do. This could be thousands, this could be millions of it. So this is, this is quite a large number that we're thinking about. And we need to input the qubits in some initial state that we can have be well-defined, right? Um, and then we need the qubits to remain coherent um, as we do whatever we're doing with them. And by coherent, that means that the quantum amplitudes that they have don't change unless we instruct them to change in certain ways, but they don't just sort of randomly lose their, their, their quantum amplitudes. Um, so then I'm going to draw each qubit as a line here going into this gray box. And in this gray box here of mystery, there's some algorithm that we're doing. Uh, and then the qubits all come out the other side of the gray box after we've carried out this algorithm on them. So what's inside the gray box? Inside the gray box performing the algorithm is what we call a universal gate set. And a universal gate set is a set of operations that we do to, to control the quantum states of these qubits and to create superposition, to cause interference, to create entanglement. Um, and together, these operations perform the algorithm that we want to do. And if you have a universal gate set, that means that any algorithm you'd like to perform can be constructed out of these basic pieces. So you need that, that gate set. And then finally, at the end, what we're going to do is we need the ability to measure each one of these qubits individually. So each one of these qubits is going to talk to its own little meter, uh, and then we'll get a zero or a one measurement result, and we'll get n classical bits out after we've put n qubits in in the beginning. So these are sort of the, the fundamental building blocks that you need to make a quantum computer. And so any physical realization, any quantum hardware that we want for gate model quantum computing is going to have to satisfy all of these different, uh, these different criteria. And so I'll talk with you as we go through these different technologies about different ways in which, in which they do so. So um, if we want to talk about the quantum gates, this is one of the important building blocks of a, of a quantum algorithm. So we have both single qubit gates where we're basically, we're changing or controlling the state of one qubit by itself. Uh, and in general, roughly speaking, we use this to create superposition and interference. Uh, you can also have gates that couple more than one qubit together. Um, and so then uh, these gates basically create entanglement. They also perform interference. Again, this is sort of very roughly speaking. But so using these different kinds of gates for both single and multiple qubits, we can, we can produce the, the desired re results that we want. And basically, any quantum algorithm that is going to have a quantum advantage means that you're using it to create and manipulate superposition and entanglement in a lot of qubits at once. So how do gates actually look in a, in a system? Well, they're actually pulsed control signals. So if you look at this, these are 
uh, sort of cartoons of like a little microwave uh, pulse that ramps up and ramps down. And here's a, a, a different pulse, for example. Um, and these pulses here all combined uh, are applied to a qubit. And that might be by shining a laser on your qubit, by putting a microwave field on your qubit or a magnetic field or an electric field. And these pulses produce a single qubit operation or a multi-qubit operation. And as you can see by looking at these pulses, they have a very specific shape, they have a very specific frequency, they have very specific timing. And so in order to do these gates, you have to perform all these operations in this very kind of specific controlled way in time. Uh, and then furthermore, in order to do the computation, you need to be able to apply these kinds of pulses to each qubit in your system. So if you have 100 qubits, that might be kind of hard. If you have a million qubits, that means you need to be able to address any one of the million qubits and, and apply these pulses to it. So that can be kind of challenging. So what does a quantum circuit or quantum algorithm look like? So here is sort of a, a, a cartoon schematic that, uh, that typically is how we look at quantum circuits. You'll have a bunch of horizontal lines here. Each one represents a different qubit. You can see they're numbered here. Uh, and then as you go along in time on the horizontal axis, you perform gates on these qubits. So for example, these gates here, like this one that says X or that one that says H, those are single qubit gates. They act on one qubit. You can see some here where they're connected by two lines, uh, by a line between two qubits, uh, and this is a two qubit gate. Uh, and so basically this looks kind of a little bit like a musical score, perhaps, if you're musical. Uh, and so you might think, okay, we're basically, we're conducting a, a symphony uh, to make this quantum algorithm. And that's actually not a bad analogy. Um, and so I like to make this analogy of what's going on as we have a quantum choir. Um, you, the, the person writing the algorithm, you're conducting, you're telling what quantum gates need to happen, and you have this adorable choir of your lovely fresh-faced qubits here all singing along. But what do you need? Making a quantum algorithm basically means we're making a very long and very complicated and very quiet song. Um, it means that all of the qubits, all the singers, they all have to be in tune, they all have to be on tempo, and they all have to be able to hear each other singing. Okay, so this is starting to get more, more challenging to do. Um, the conductor, the gates, you, need to be able to conduct each one of these singers individually. You tell this singer, sing that note, this singer, sing that note, you two sing in harmony now. Uh, and you need to be able to do that perfectly. You need to be able to tell them exactly when to go in and nobody makes a mistake and what their pitch is or when they sing. Um, and the bigger you make this choir, the more qubits, the longer the songs, the longer the algorithm, the greater the chances that somebody somewhere messes up and the song doesn't come out quite how you want to. So this is sort of part of the challenge of doing this. And so if you think about it in this way, the, the real challenge then becomes if you think about in the real world, uh, there's another concert going on too, and it's very loud. So you're trying to sing this very, very quiet song with your little qubits here, and there's a big rock concert going in the background. And this rock concert is all of the other particles and atoms and fields out there in the world that you're not controlling. Um, and all of these things are drowning out the sound of your qubits or giving them false information about when to sing or things like that and confusing stuff. And so basically the challenge of quantum computing, uh, making the hardware work is that our conductor doing the gates is imperfect. Our singers are imperfect. And then there's this other band here in the middle of what the singers are doing that's really, really loud as we're trying to sing our quiet song. And so what we're trying to do uh, when we make a quantum computer is figure out how can we best, despite the imperfect conductor and the imperfect singers and the other band, make a long, quiet, beautiful quantum song. So there's a bunch of different platforms, physical platforms that people have used for, for quantum information processing, for quantum computing. Uh, and some of these are also used for quantum sensing and quantum networking and things like that. Uh, and so we're gonna, we're gonna sort of cover a lot of these today in the talk. Um, there are trapped ions and neutral atoms. Uh, there are superconducting qubits. There's semiconducting qubits. There are optical, uh, optically active defects, which I won't talk about in depth today. Uh, they're not used as much for quantum computing. Uh, and then there's sort of photonics based on light. 
So um, we can go ahead and, and get started. I'll talk about this. As Marlu mentioned, I uh, am currently uh, doing research in trapped ions, also some in neutral atoms. And, uh, and previously, I've worked a lot in superconducting qubits. Uh, so these I know quite familiarly. And then these other ones here, I will give you some uh, uh, discussion of, although I, uh, I haven't worked in them personally myself. So trapped ions and neutral atoms, basically, to have these as qubits. Uh, an ion is a charged atom. Uh, and a neutral atom, I mean, is just an uncharged atom. And the idea behind these as qubits is, what if you could hold individual atoms in the middle of nothingness? Just nothing else around them. And what I'm showing here are pictures of ions or neutral atoms that are literally the only atoms around. Um, and the spacing in between these is some microns between each atom, so you can resolve them separately on a on a camera with a with a microscope, basically. Uh, and this and and these are trapped in vacuum in ultra high vacuum uh, with uh, with nothing else around nearby. Uh, so this gives you excellent isolation from the environment, right? These atoms are truly kind of off by themselves. So that's a way of making that background rock concert be much, much quieter. You don't have anything right next to you in a, in a crystal or something like that. Uh, and so as a result, these uh, ions or atoms can have very long coherence times, many seconds. The, the current coherence time record uh, for, a, for a qubit is about an hour. Uh, for uh, for a trapped ion qubit. And in fact, this long coherence time uh, and excellent isolation is what makes these also very good as atomic clocks. I won't talk about that today, but a lot of what um, is done for uh, ion and atom-based quantum computing has come out of research on making better atomic clocks and in turn has fed back into research on making better atomic clocks. So ions and atoms, they're sort of plentiful to be able to trap in this vacuum chamber if you do it right. And they're all identical. Literally every one of these ions or every one of these atoms is exactly the same as its neighbors. Uh, and that can be a good thing or a bad thing, depending on how you how you look at it. But it's, it, it's, uh, it's handy for quantum computing purposes. So then the question is, OK, well, we've got these. How can you actually trap them, right? And, and how can you control and measure their quantum states once you've trapped them? Neither of these things are that obvious. So let's, let's dive into that a little bit. So for an ion, um, you can trap them. And this is one way that I'm going to show you to trap them in what we call a radio frequency or Paul trap. And so here what I've done is I'm showing you four uh, rods in three dimension, and here's the the end on zone, and we're gonna we're, the end on view, excuse me, and we're gonna put voltages on each of these rods. So on the red rods, we're gonna put an oscillating radio frequency voltage, um, and on the on the gray rods, we're gonna put a static DC voltage. Uh, and what this does is this makes a quadrupole right here in the center, which is like a saddle point. And so uh, if you think about a saddle point and putting a, 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 a particle at a saddle point, it's going to want to roll down one side. But this is a saddle point that is flapping up and down, actually. It looks like this. And so when the saddle point is flapping because of this oscillating RF voltage, if the ion tries to roll down, by the time it gets very far, it decides, oh, actually, it's uphill this direction, not downhill. So then it comes back. Uh, and it does this sort of all uh, in, in any direction that it tries. It will, in a time averaged way, feel like it's kind of uphill and thus be confined. Um, and then, uh, and then in, the, in the other direction here along this line, you can put uh, voltages on these segmented electrodes here and make a potential well that, uh, that um, confines them along this third dimension here along the dotted line. And because the ions are charged, if you put two or ions in the same trap, they'll repel each other and they'll kind of line up uh, like this. And that's how you end up getting the strings like we saw in the previous picture. Now, um, historically, this kind of a trap was made in a machine shop, but you can also take these electrodes and unfold them down onto a plane. Uh, and on the plane like this, you still have this quadrupole, you still have this saddle point, the symmetry is a little lower. And so what this allows you to do is to, is to trap ions where the electrodes that you're using to trap the ions could be made on, uh, on a chip, for example, uh, microfabricated in a clean room. Uh, and so this will allow you to make a larger scale trap. Now, how about trapping a neutral atom? Trapping a neutral atom is going to be a bit different. These ions, this trapping works because the ion is charged. 
And so electric fields talk to that charge very strongly and we can hold it with the electric field. But a, a neutral atom doesn't have any charge. And so we can't, we can't uh, trap it using its charge. But what we can do is we can shine a, a focused laser beam. And it turns out that if you have a very tightly focused laser beam and you choose the laser wavelength and intensity correctly, you can actually make it so that for the, for the atom, it's energetically uh, shifts its energy slightly lower when it's in the laser beam. And so that makes the atom kind of want to live at that minimum. And so for energetically, it's favorable for the atom to stay at the tight focus of this beam. Uh, and so then if you make more than one focused beam, you can have multiple traps and you can trap multiple ions. And this uh, scheme here, these sort of little focus beams are called optical tweezers um, because it's like a little tweezer that can hold a, a single ion, or a single atom, excuse me. You can also hold things other than atoms with optical tweezers. You can hold glass beads and things like that. Um, and so you can make many such focused laser beams and build up an array of atoms. Uh, you can also make standing waves of light. And if you make standing waves of light, it makes a potential that instead of looking like this, it looks sort of like an egg crate. Uh, and you can trap uh, atoms in the, in the minima of this sort of egg crate, egg carton potential. Um, so this is another way in which you can hold atoms. This is a little less reconfigurable, but is a little more power efficient. So now let's talk about um, the actual, the, the quantum states that we would use and, and the state preparation and single qubit gates for ions and atoms, which is basically quite similar between, between the two of them. So when you trap an ion or an atom, uh, you, there's a variety of different quantum states that, that are available in that atom. So how do we choose two to make a qubit? Um, a classic thing that people do is to choose the spin of a valence electron. Um, or you could choose the spin of the atom or ion's nucleus, or you could choose a combination of the two, or it could be something that involves the, the electron changing orbitals. Um, this is more unusual, but sometimes is done. And so in sort of a very, very simple picture, uh, we could say, all right, maybe it's the spin of the valence electron. And if you put on a magnetic field, that spin has two values here. And now we've managed to make that that canonical textbook qubit, that electron spin in a magnetic field. And, and the energy splitting between these, depending on exactly how you realize it, might be kilohertz, might be gigahertz. If it's an electron orbital, this will be an optical frequency. But so you've got two states here uh, like this that, that are basically a property of your electron or your nucleus. Now, um, if you have electron and nuclear spin, you get more complicated sets of states and you can pick any two. You could pick these two and make those your qubit, or you could pick those two and make your, those your, your qubit. Uh, so there's a lot of different levels and there's different reasons why you might wanna choose different ones of this. This is just one example. I don't wanna go in great depth, but the point is it can be quite complicated. So how do we prepare the qubit state? Remember when we have qubits, one of the first things we have to do is prepare a well-known state. And for, for ions and atoms, we use what's called optical pumping with a, with a resonant laser beam. So if we have some population, which I'll draw as these orange circles in these, in these qubit states, uh, we make use of the fact that somewhere up higher here, some optical transition away, there's another state that the ion or atom has. Uh, and if you shine a laser beam on that connects one of these to that state, then this state will be sort of short-lived and it will decay away and it will decay down here or decay down here. Um, but what happens if it decays back here, it gets re-excited again and it keeps doing that until eventually it decays over here. And if it decays here, there's no laser beam making it leave. So eventually you sort of build up all of the population uh, in this other state. Uh, and so we've basically, we have pumped the population into one state, that's the term optical pumping. So this allows us to prepare the, the state using laser beams. Um, then if you wanna do a, a gate operation, a single qubit gate on this, uh, on this state, then you can use a couple of laser beams. So you can use two laser beams, which are detuned from this upper state here, but are otherwise their difference frequency is resonant with the qubit. Uh, and if you shine this on with high power, you can cause transitions between this state and that state. And this is how you do a, a single qubit gate operation. Uh, you can also drive just an oscillating magnetic field, uh, for example, and drive transitions between these uh, two qubit states. 
Um, so there's a bunch of different ways we can do this. Now, how do you do entangling gates? So the for for uh, ions and atoms, these sort of single qubit gates and the state preparation, this is this is the same between them. Uh, but for ions and atoms, people typically use different ways of doing entangling gates. So um, for the trapped ions, they're charged, they repel each other, they're a few microns away. And so the direct interactions between the ions are basically negligible. Um, but one way of saying that um, they're repelling each other is to say that their motion is very strongly coupled. So if this ion moves, that ion will feel it and, and it feels like a force on this one when, when that one changes its position. Uh, and so when one of them wiggles, the other one will wiggle. And so as a result, what happens is when you have ions in a trap, here I'm drawing it for two ions, they tend to move together always in these sort of eigenmodes of, of motion. And, uh, and so the idea then is this motion, which we can laser cool until it's basically at the ground state of motion, uh, is something that we can uh, use as, as another quantum degree of freedom. We can use this as sort of a quantum bus. And so if you couple the state of this ion to the motion, then this one can learn about that ion state from the motion. Uh, and in that way, uh, you, can, you can get a gate operation. So in order to couple the spin or the motion together, you typically use high power laser beams or you might use magnetic field gradients. Uh, but basically this is how uh, uh, ion entangling gates are, are done. For neutral atoms, it's a bit different. Um, so for neutral atoms, gates, entangling gates are based on exciting uh, the atoms to very highly excited states that are called Rydberg states, where the electron, instead of being very close to the nucleus, is sort of at a much larger orbit. It's, it's much more loosely bound. Um, and so if you excite, if you have a single atom here and you excite from the ground state up to a Rydberg state with a laser, uh, you can do that. Uh, and then the, the uh, electron that's up in this Rydberg state is sort of a very sensitive antenna. It basically means that um, as it's farther from the nucleus, uh, it both sort of broadcasts about itself uh, and receives, it's much more sensitive to electric fields that are, that are maybe received from elsewhere uh, than otherwise. And so what happens is if you have two atoms that are close enough to each other, um, and here, this plot shows basically the distance between two atoms and what the energy levels are. So two atoms in the ground state, this is the energy. This is an entangled state, which is one Rydberg atom plus one ground atom, and we're not sure which is which. And this is exciting both atoms to the Rydberg state. And if you get close enough, these sort of two antennas, these two Rydberg electrons sort of know about each other, and that causes their energy to change. And it causes it to change in such a way that you can't actually drive them both into the Rydberg state. This transition is now off resonant. And so basically you can make, you can drive and you can drive directly from this unentangled state to this entangled state because you can't drive back out into this um, Rydberg, Rydberg state due to this. So, so the quantum states are coupled. Um, and, uh, and so then you can use this sort of interaction to, to entangle the, uh, the qubits. And so here, this cartoon is showing an array of atoms. Uh, and these different atoms, if you excite one here to the Rydberg state, then there's this circuit, uh, this circle here that we call the Rydberg blockade radius. This phenomenon is called Rydberg blockade. Um, and any other atoms that are inside this Rydberg blockade radius um, can't be excited to the Rydberg state. And in principle, you could entangle them with this Rydberg atom if you, uh, if you drive them appropriately with, uh, with the Rydberg laser. So this is how you do entangling gates for neutral atoms. You can actually do this for trapped ions as well, but for technical reasons, it's a bit more challenging and people prefer to use the motional method for trapped ions. Um, but uh, with the neutral atoms, this is how, this is how entanglement's done. Finally, you can ask, well, how are we going to measure them? Remember the end of the algorithm we have to measure? And we measure using what we call state-dependent fluorescence. So here are your two qubit states here. Here's your optical transition up high. And what you do is you shine on a resonant laser beam. It's resonant from one of these states to a level up there. Uh, and then there's two key features about how you choose this beam. One is that it needs to be resonant for this state, but if you're in this state, it shines up and there's not actually a state up here. So you can't drive this transition from this state. So only this state will get excited by the laser, not this one. And then secondly, you need to make sure that this state, this upper state, 
only decays back to where it came from and doesn't decay down to this other qubit state. Uh, we call this a cycling transition. So if that's the case, then basically if you're in this qubit state, you'll absorb laser light and emit a photon in all directions and absorb laser light again and emit a photon and absorb laser light again and emit a photon in all directions. Whereas if you're in this state here, you don't interact with the laser at all and you don't emit any photons. And so by looking to see if there's fluorescence, if there's photons emitted from this ion or atom, uh, that can tell you what the qubit state is. Uh, and it's sufficient to sort of collect and count just a couple percent of these photons that come out using a, a, a lens, an objective or something, and some kind of photon detector, like a, uh, an ultra-sensitive camera or photomultiplier tube. And so what it looks like in the lab, so here's actually a little glowing dot. This is a fluorescing ion. And this is actually, you have to believe me because you can't see anything, but this is an ion that's not fluorescing because it's in the other state. Um, and so, uh, so basically what you'll see and the pictures you saw before were fluorescing ions and atoms. This is how we read out the states is to see, is it fluorescing? Is it not fluorescing? So uh, there's a bunch of hardware that's necessary for these experiments. And I'm just going to talk a little bit about some of this here. We talked about all these lasers. Um, so uh, lasers are, are essential to uh, qubits based on ions and atoms. Um, and you need lots of wavelengths, different wavelengths from the infrared to the ultraviolet, depending on what type of atom or ion you're choosing. Some of these lasers might have to be high power. Some of them might be more than 10 watts for Rydberg gates or for optical tweezers. Some of these have to have very, very narrow line widths. Um, so very, very low noise lasers, basically. Some of these lasers uh, need to be frequency doubled or summed in nonlinear crystals, like you see here on the right. And basically, you can see this is a very complicated optical system. And each one of these little components that sits here is there for a purpose, was placed there by hand by a person and tuned exactly into the right position. So these are complex experiments from an optics standpoint to, to set up. So how would you scale up a trapped ion quantum computer? Um, well, one uh, architecture is what we call the quantum CCD architecture. Uh, here, you can basically trap an ion in vacuum using electric fields, and you move the ions around between different zones of your trap. Uh, it's kind of like a city where you can imagine that the, the qubits are cars on the street and you drive them all down to this street to do a gate on them and then you drive them over here to park them for memory until it's time to, to, to do another algorithm. Uh, and then you can basically take a big complicated structure like this and you have laser beams that come into some subset of it or microwaves. Uh, and then the idea is that you can microfabricate something like this to, to go to larger scale. And in fact, this is something that's been done. And now there are both research and commercial entities that are making these kinds of traps uh, with, um, with microfabricated uh, electrodes to hold many ions at the same time. You can also uh, connect ions by entangling the ion with a photon that they emit and then collecting those photons and interfering with them with each other. Uh, and basically, this is the basis of a quantum network. And so you can perform distributed quantum computing by networking together smaller ion traps rather than having a lot of, uh, of uh, zones in that sort of big city-like ion trap. Um, and so one vision of how this might look is you have a bunch of small ion traps that are called, we call ELUs here, and each one has a fiber link into some switch that then basically lets you create entanglement between these ELUs to build up a larger scale algorithm. This is something that's still very much work in progress. It's uh, not quite as mature as the other uh, method, but uh, is, uh, is, is uh, still a topic of, of research. For neutral atom qubits, uh, basically you can set up different arrays. So what you can see here are atoms that can be moved around into arbitrary patterns in 1D or in 2D or actually even in 3D here. And basically you combine optical tweezers that can move around with some static tweezers or lattices. And by rearranging the atoms here and then shining laser beams and microwave fields on them, some of which can be individually addressed, this lets you run algorithms on, uh, on the different atoms. Um, and the way this looks in the lab is that uh, all of the confinement and the control and the readout is optical, it's laser light based. So you'll have basically a big lens of some sort here or here, and you send in, um, you basically shape the light for the traps 
using commercial uh, spatial light modulators or digital micromirrors or acousto-optic deflectors. All of these are sort of commercial items. Some of them are used for movie projectors, for example. Um, but that allows you to make lots and lots of little uh, patterns of where the, the, the tweezer traps might be. Uh, and then you use a camera to read out the, the state of the atoms, who's where and what state they're in. So uh, this, this technique has been sort of ramping up rapidly in the past few years um, and, uh, and is, is one of the sort of the, the, the uh, exciting new developments in, in quantum hardware right now is, is how this has been coming on. And, uh, and the sort of the fidelity with which you can do the gate operations and the measurements and stuff is starting to become competitive with the, with the trapped ions, which are currently sort of the, the leading performance in terms of size of quantum algorithms or the performance of the individual operations. So now let's change gears. We'll talk about a different kind of qubit. And these are sort of qubits by design, which is superconducting qubits. That's sort of the reason for a superconducting qubit. So we have um, atoms and ions, um, but we're limited to what nature gives us. And basically only a subset of this periodic table, the ones I've circled in red, uh, sort of have properties that make them readily usable for the kinds of stuff that I just talked about. So, you know, we really don't have that many choices and they're sort of relatively inflexible, but what if you could instead make a designer qubit effectively? You know, you could choose to have stronger coupling between the qubits. You could choose to do the control and the readout electronically. Um, you could design it to have insensitivity to its environment in different ways while still being able to control it. Um, there's lots of ways you might want to design a, a qubit like this. So one way you can do this is with a superconducting circuit. So um, if you make an LC circuit, this is a harmonic oscillator. And if you choose the inductor and the capacitor to have certain values where you have sort of a gigahertz frequency, make it out of a superconductor. It needs to be cold enough that this is superconducting. You have a low loss harmonic oscillator. You could have something that looks like this where you basically have a harmonic potential. And here are the energy states of the, of the harmonic oscillator. Because it's a harmonic oscillator, the energy states are all evenly spaced from each other. So you can't just address these two as a qubit. Now there's ways you can encode quantum information in a harmonic oscillator. There are people who do that. But if you want to make this a, a, a qubit with just those two levels right there, you need to do something different. And what you do is you change this inductor to a Josephson junction. And the Josephson junction is basically a nonlinear inductor you can think of it as. It's a, it's a tunnel barrier between two superconductors. And this changes this harmonic potential to this sort of softening curve potential. So instead where you used to have energy levels like this, now the energy levels look like this and they're different. This first energy level is different from the second one and the third one. And so now you can address just these two levels by driving them at their frequency and you won't excite these other ones here. So, um, so this is how you can make a, a qubit using uh, an electrical circuit. Uh, and uh, as, assuming that the losses in this circuit are low, then this can be coherent for longer and longer time. Uh, you can also uh, control the qubit state here using microwave fields that come from a nearby antenna. You have a little loop here or a little uh, capacitor here, and that couples to the junction uh, or the loop and things like this and, and allows you to, to control the qubit state. Um, you can also add on another inductance if you want to. And basically, all the different types of superconducting qubits that are out there, and you've maybe heard various names of them, like transmons or fluxoniums or flux qubits or Cooper pair boxes, all of these are made of basically choosing different amounts of capacitor and inductor and Josephson junction, effectively. Um, one thing that's important for all these is you've got to be cold. You need um, basically this qubit splitting to be much larger than the available thermal energy. And so that means that we want to be sort of at millikelvin temperatures. You can see the energy scale here. This is like a quarter of a Kelvin or something like that. And so we want to be well below that. Um, and when you're well below that, if you just let it sit, it will initialize itself by relaxing into the ground state here. Uh, you can also initialize by measurement, um, and that's often what's done these days. So how do you measure a superconducting qubit? Well, here's your qubit circuit. You made a, you made a circuit. Um, and here you can make another circuit. This is just a, a, an LC oscillator, not a nonlinear one, but a linear one. Um, and we'll, we'll call this the cavity, but it's basically, it's, it's just a, another harmonic oscillator. And we couple them together with capacitors. 
And then we couple the cavity to some readout microwave line with additional capacitors. And basically what happens is if we design the parameters correctly, the frequency, the resonant frequency of this cavity depends on the state of the qubit. It will shift by some amount to chi, depending on when the, whether the qubit is in state zero or in state one. And so what we can do is we can probe the cavity, we can send in a weak microwave signal and, and uh, basically look at the reflected signal out. And by doing that, that measures the qubit. And then the measurement result is encoded in this reflected signal. Now, this reflected signal is really, really, really weak. It's way weaker than any kind of signal that you would typically use at room temperature. Uh, and so as a result, you need to have an ultra low noise amplifier, really basically operating at the quantum limits of how sensitive you can be in order to see this output signal and understand what's going on with the qubit with high fidelity. Um, so this is how we measure superconducting qubits. So if you look at a typical superconducting qubit chip, this is a result from ETH group in Zurich. So you'll see here, here are these qubits. The qubits are in yellow, and then they're coupled together with these lines here. These are basically um, wires with capacitors on the end of them that allow you to couple the qubits to each other. And then all these other things here are the readout cavities and control lines to control the state of the qubit in the green and the red there, for example. Um, and, uh, and one thing to note is that you need a control and readout wire for every single qubit here. So this is a seven qubit circuit and you can see all these wires coming in. You can imagine if this were to get bigger and bigger and bigger, it would get harder and harder and harder to get all these wires in here. Um, the, uh, the coupling between these qubits um, is basically only to nearest neighbors. Remember with the atoms and the ions, we can actually move them around and rearrange who talks to who. Uh, with the superconducting circuits, we're sort of stuck with who talks to who. Uh, and so that, that, can, um, that can have some impact on algorithms. But anyway, the, the point is it's challenging to route these lines. Anyway, I also wanted to show you, so here's a one millimeter scale bar. This is a fairly large chip. And here's a zoom in on this, on this, here's a 200 micron scale bar. And then let's do a zoom in on this part of the qubit right here and zooming in all the way down basically at the size of like a virus particle. Um, this is like a COVID particle sized spot where in between this piece of superconductor and that piece of superconductor, there's a very thin tunnel barrier, aluminum oxide barrier. And these are the Josephson junctions that make the qubit have its nonlinearity. Um, so how do you scale up a superconducting qubit? Well, you microfabricate these ever larger. Um, and so here are some commercial uh, architectures for doing this, where you have different qubits and they're talking to each other with different connections. Um, because they only connect to the nearest neighbors, this can impact the efficiency and the performance of some kind of algorithms that you want to do. So this is, a, uh, this is sort of a, a major consideration. Um, in order to scale this up, we need to start taking the wiring out of the plane. And so you might think about taking your qubit chip, flipping it upside down on some other chip and wiring things out that way. Uh, and then once you've wired out of the chip, then you have to connect from this, this bottom of this pryostat to your room temperature electronics. And so you'll see all these kinds of wires here. These are the kind of typical images that oftentimes people associate with a quantum computer. And it's basically all the wiring. Uh, semiconducting qubits, uh, these are individually trapped electrons. So it's kind of like the idea of a trapped ion or atom, but instead of trapping them in vacuum, you're trapping them in a semiconductor. Uh, and then by putting voltages on these electrodes, uh, you can put them into a certain quantum state. You can control their quantum state. You can get them to couple together. Um, and this usually requires cryogenic, again, typically millikelvin, but people are working on somewhat higher temperature uh, type temperatures. Uh, and so the idea that people have with this is like, well, you say, okay, you might be able to uh, fabricate this efficiently because it's something that's, uh, you know, that we know how to fabricate stuff in silicon. But this is actually quite different in various ways from the considerations that you need for making a computer uh, processor. And so it's, it's not quite that simple. Um, the same kind of challenges exist as for superconducting qubits. Plus, now these qubits are really close together. So here, here you've got two whole qubits. Remember how that superconducting qubit was 200 microns big. Here you've got two qubits and 200 nanometers apart from each other. So this becomes really um, challenging. Uh, and then you need the material cleanliness to be good as well. 
Um, another uh, final thing that I'll talk about is basically optical photons. So optical photons make nice qubits because they're quantum mechanical, even in air at room temperature. You don't need to be cold. You don't need to be in ultra high vacuum. Um, you can just have a photon flying around and that works. Um, Optical, optical quantum computing is a, a slightly different from, from the way that other people, uh, the other technologies do, do the gates. This is uh, typically what's called a measurement-based quantum computing, which, which is uh, slightly different from the kind of typical gate model, but you can do equivalent things. But the idea is you prepare some non-classical state, either a squeeze state here or some entangled state here, um, basically using some, 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 uh, uh, special techniques to produce these quantum states. And then you basically, uh, so again, squeeze states or entangled photon pairs, and then you send them through a series of beam splitters, of interferometers of various sorts. And um, these interferometers here, you can basically choose what they're doing um, on the fly sometimes, and then you send them to photon detectors at the end, which might measure the number of photons or might just measure the presence or absence of a photon. Um, and then this tells you about what quantum state you have. And then by continually adding more of these quantum states of light in and feeding back on the control of the interferometers based on the measurement results, you can perform a computation. Um, so in order to scale these up, this is an example. This is a, a system in, in China that was built that uh, was used to demonstrate a classically intractable uh, problem. Uh, this is total sort of brute force. This is just somebody building stuff and aligning it with great delicacy um, and, uh, and getting something to work. But the future of, of this uh, optical computing has to be uh, using a chip like this and having all of these beam splitters and photon detectors and things like that integrated on a chip. Um, there's still the control line challenges. There's still challenges about getting the optics to work. Um, and then uh, for all of these technologies, there's a bunch of uh, classical electronics. So inside this, big uh, cryostat here um, where you have this tiny chip that's your quantum computer uh, for a superconducting setup, you've got all of these uh, electronics outside that are producing the signals to control. Remember all of the control lines, all of the readout lines, there are these huge racks of equipment. And this is just for 50 qubits. So you can imagine if you try and make a million of them. Um, here's some disorganized wiring in our lab. So basically the control electronics and all of this stuff is another important thing that needs to be scaled up for, uh, for uh, quantum computing to be efficient. All right, with that, I've covered a lot of ground. Uh, it's time we can take some questions from, uh, from the audience. Fantastic. This is a really great talk, Dan. I see comments on Discord that people have never heard such a good and comprehensive talk on quantum computing hardware in one, one deck. <laughs> it's, it's, it's wonderful. There are also many questions and also many people already trying to answer questions. I will, we have sufficient time, so I will just walk through all the questions and ask them to you. Okay. And I need to scroll back a lot. <laughs> well, I'm glad. I hope this was helpful to people. It's This is only just the very tip of the iceberg, but hopefully gives you a little bit of a flavor of the way that different people have been able to realize quantum technologies and and control them and, and make them do what we want them to do for quantum computing. Yeah. Yeah, fantastic. And so good to see the comparison and have all of them uh, in one. Um, Mustafa Zidan from Egypt asked, asks, is it challenging to create quantum memory and what kind of challenges are involved? Can you share a bit about that? Yeah, so, so quantum memory is basically just describing like how coherent uh, you know, you want to store some superposition state that you've made. Um, how coherent can can you be over some period of time? And so, for example, as we talked about, if you have trapped ions or neutral atoms, for example, you can store quantum information in in one of those uh, and have it last for many seconds, even. So, so that's a that's you know a way to to create a memory that's good. For superconductors, you can make a superconducting cavity uh, that has very long memory times compared to a superconducting qubit, for example. Um, the big challenge with quantum memories is there are certain quantum technologies that can store information really efficiently, 
But if the information that you're producing is made in a different quantum technology, let's say you have a superconducting qubit and you want to store that information in a trapped ion, it's very challenging. It's still an unsolved problem of how do you how do you connect that? How do you transfer quantum information between these technologies? And this is this is a big area of research right now. And um, there's there, there's a lot of a lot of effort. And it's a very hard technical problem. Yeah. Great. Then uh, Constantin Drabo from Burkina, Fa uh, Burkina Faso asks, uh, how long are coherence times for different types of qubits? Uh, it Well, it depends within the qubits and also among the qubits. So as I said, trapped ions and neutral atoms, the sort of the, the best uh, coherence times are typically, um, for ions, like I said, it's up to sort of like an hour or something like that, typically seconds. Neutral atoms with dynamical decoupling can be sort of seconds, uh, depending. There's other tricks you can play to make them mini seconds. Uh, superconducting qubits, coherence times for a, for a qubit circuit these days are typically in the, um, in the, the range of like a, a couple hundred microseconds or something like that, start approaching a millisecond, depending on exactly what you're talking about. And for superconducting cavities, they can be sort of tens of milliseconds. For semiconducting qubits, it depends on the exact realization of things, but it can be um, microseconds to even milliseconds, depending on what kind of a spin you're using and things like that. Um, for photonics, uh, basically the, you know, the, the limit is usually loss in the, in the photonic system, uh, oftentimes more than some kind of like decoherence from, from, uh, dephasing, but, uh, but yeah, but so the, the coherence time there is sort of like as long as the photon flies around, which is usually, you know, nanoseconds to microseconds, depending on the circuit. Great. Then Mohammad Riza from Iran asks, uh, recently I heard about magic states. Do you know what, what those are and how would they be implemented in hardware systems? Yeah, so a magic state can be implemented in a bunch of different hardware systems. And in fact, the photonic stuff at the end, um, basically what they're doing is they're making magic states at the beginning and, and bringing it in. So basically the, the idea is that if you have a universal gate set, um, to do uh, quantum algorithms, that's nice. But sometimes in order to get that universal gate set, sometimes it's hard to make one of the gates work well. Uh, and, so, uh, and so what you can do under the right circumstances, you can say, all right, if I can instead prepare a specific kind of quantum state as an input to my quantum processor, then I can do the rest of the gates without needing that one tricky gate. Um, and, so, and so that's sort of, uh, a different version of using, uh, you know, different way in which you can perform a quantum computation. Yeah, so people have made magic states in various of these technologies uh, and sort of showed that this is, you know, this is a way to achieve some of your computing goals. But magic state just, you know, there's, there's nothing really magic about it. It just means that it's a very particular kind of quantum state that you prepare that, um, already has some some entanglement and things like that in it that make it so that you don't need this sort of difficult gate um, in your universal gate set. Great. Then Shamarita from Germany asks, um, is trapping ions also possible using laser light? Yes, you can trap an ion using laser light. Um, the thing that, that I'll say is that an ion trap uh, with electric fields is typically about a hundred thousand or a million times stronger of a trap, deeper of a trap than than trapping using a laser beam. And so um, generally ion trappers don't use laser beams to trap the ions because they have this stronger trap option available. But there's lots of interesting research that people are doing where uh, they actually try combining them. And one thing you can do, for example, is to trap your ions in an, in an ion trap, and then you can use laser beams to sort of keep some of the ions from vibrating. And that changes which ions are able to move and which ions can't move. And that changes how you can do gates between different ions, for example. But yeah, absolutely, you can do that. But um, it's usually people use the deeper electric uh, electromagnetic traps. Great. Then uh, Joseph from the US asks, 
about the Rydberg atoms, could the inability to excite two nearby atoms to the Rydberg state also be due to the Pauli exclusion principle? Can you explain? Um, it's not actually, I mean, so yes, if you got two atoms close enough, then, you know, then you can, then, then Pauli exclusion, if you have fermionic atoms can make them not be in the same place. Um, in this instance, it's not a Pauli exclusion thing. It's just that, you know, you excite these Rydberg atoms and they're sort of very, very large orbits. And so they're very sensitive to electric fields. And they're both sensitive to electric fields and generating electric fields because they're running around. So they basically sense each other's electric fields and that sort of shifts their properties ever so slightly. And that's what causes their energies to shift out of resonance with your driving field. You have a great question from Varda from India. What properties do we consider when choosing elements for ion trapped and neutral atom quantum computers? That's a great question, yeah. So basically, um, in order to get atoms or ions into the trap, um, we need to be able to cool them down um, so that they have low enough energy so that they're moving slowly enough that we can hold on to them into the trap. And so we need some species that we're able to shine laser light on and get them to cool down. Uh, laser cooling is a whole nother topic that, that I didn't really have time to discuss in this talk, but basically, um, depending on the electronic structure of the atom, uh, to do laser cooling, you want to be able to excite the atom and then have it come back to the kind of state that you started from. Uh, and so only certain types of atoms or, or ions uh, have that sort of happen easily. Um, and those are, in general, atoms that have one valence electron. So the first column of the periodic table for neutral atoms or the second column of the periodic table for ions uh, are like that. Now, for there are some atoms or ions that have two valence electrons that you can also still do this with. Um, but all of those sort of transition metals, everything in the, in the middle there, the energy structure is sort of sufficiently complicated. Or once you get out to the far right where you have mostly filled uh, P shells, um, the number of levels that it can decay to becomes large, and so it's tricky to laser cool them. Um, so that's that's the main reason. Fantastic. And I'm skipping through the many questions. Um, can you share, even imagine we have room temperature superconductors. Is it right that according to your explanation, we would still need to cool these superconducting qubits that are made out of these room temperature superconductors? That's right, because what you need for the qubit, remember, the thing that we care about here is the that that loud rock concert in the background, right? And so that loud rock concert in the background, the colder it is, the quieter that concert is. And so basically, you need for a superconducting qubit, the energy of the superconducting qubit is sort of set by its frequency, which is some gigahertz, right? And that corresponds to the amount of thermal energy that's around when you're at, you know, a couple of hundred millikelvin or something. So even if this, even if your circuit is superconducting at room temperature, um, there's enough background noise at the qubit frequency that it's going to constantly be scrambling the qubit. So you need to have it so the background energy is less than the available qubit energy um, for a superconducting circuit for that to work. Now, I'll just say for the ions and atoms, remember, the qubit energy is also low. It's also gigahertz. So why isn't that a problem. The reason that we don't have to cool those to millikelvin temperatures is because they're so isolated from the environment that we can optically pump them and then they kind of stay in their place and they're they're very, very, you know, it's like they have earmuffs on. Um, they are very insensitive to the environment, whereas the superconducting, superconducting qubits are made of millions and billions of atoms and they're surrounded by all sorts of them. So they're very strongly coupled to their environment. I will just I will ask just a few more questions. One is on uh, the advantages of different technologies. Mustafa Zidan from Egypt asks, given that using artificial atoms, the superconducting qubits, uh, gives more space for control and tuning a variety variety of parameters, parameters, why still focus on trapped ions or neutral atoms? What advantage do they offer? And later someone asked, um, photonic quantum computers, I can do stuff at room temperature. Why still actually bother about the superconducting qubits in which we need to cool in dilution refrigerators? Can yeah. you share a little bit? These, these, these are great questions. Well, the answer to this is that 
all of these technologies have pros and all of these technologies have cons. And none of these technologies have such great pros and such minimal cons that it's clear that that's the one you ought to pick. And that's why people are working on all of them. So for example, with, with superconducting qubits, um, yeah, there's they're sort of nice control and things like that, but the connectivity is not as good and you need this dilution refrigerator and you need all the wiring and stuff like that that comes down, that's challenging. With the neutral atoms, the control is lovely and the trapping is lovely, it's all optical. You don't need an ion trap circuit in there, for example. But the ability to um, to do everything coherently isn't quite as advanced as high performance as the trapped ions. The trapped ions have amazing coherence times, way longer than a superconducting qubit does. But the gate operations are not quite as fast. You can't run it as a high a clock speed, for example. The photonic qubits, you know, you say, well, it, I don't need vacuum or room temperature, but there are challenges there. And you have to create these initial quantum states. You have to do it well. You have to not have, you have to have very low losses in your photonics in order for everything to sort of come out and work and be able to go to larger and larger scale. So everything has the things that you can point to as like, this is an advantage, but everything has some Achilles heel where it's not quite, um, you know, it's none of these technologies right now are ready to make a large scale quantum computer as is. They all need new ideas, new scientific development in order to be able to, to realize that promise. Yeah. And with that, you also answered another question about the progress in quantum computing. Very last question is a personal one to you, Daniel. Yeah. From Muhammad Bakar Amin, he asks, what motivated you, Dr. Daniel, to shift from superconducting to ion-trapped quantum computing? So um, for me, it was about learning something new and broadening my skills. Um, I was excited to, I was, I've always been excited about quantum information and sort of precision measurement and being able to explore the quantum world. Um, I really enjoyed working in superconducting qubits and I still enjoy uh, following the field and, and talking to my colleagues there. Um, trapped ions let me learn something new and different. And, um, and so now I'm in the position by having done that, that I can give this talk and, and talk with expertise about lots of different quantum technologies. So for me, that's, that's fun to have grown my knowledge and my skills. Fantastic. And so I will take the last question. <clears throat> that question was, Daniel and Marlou, how do you know each other? The reason is that we both work at the National Institute of Standards and Technology in Boulder, Colorado, where the focus is on a variety of, of quantum uh, information science and technologies. I work personally on chip scale atomic clocks, Kardec size atomic clocks, um, and that will be useful whenever you cannot receive GPS signals, which are steered by the big atomic clocks we have at NIST and elsewhere. While Danielle works in another group, the Ion Storage Group here at NIST in Boulder, Colorado. With that, I would like to really thank you for your talk, Daniel. This was fantastic, an extremely comprehensive overview and a big applause from everyone. I see on the Discord people say this is the best talk on quantum hardware I have ever seen. And uh, I will you. keep you updated on the feedback we receive from everyone here. Sounds good. Well, it's been great to talk to everybody. I hope this was interesting. I hope you've learned something and, and you're excited about all these different quantum technologies uh, as I am. Thanks a lot, Marlou. Thank you very much. I will take over the screen share and um, share a bit about how you can learn more about quantum hardware in the upcoming weeks. The main other component we will have on quantum hardware in this year's program is virtual lab tours. If you scroll through the program, we are now in week two. Next week, we will have the first, or actually already the second, we had a virtual lab tour by MIT on Friday. The second virtual lab tour will be at Oxford Quantum Circuits, superconducting quantum computer uh, company um, on Wednesday, June 19th. Then scrolling further through the, um, the schedule, you will see a virtual lab tour at Atom Computing neutral atom quantum computing. Then the next week, we will have a slightly different lab tour on quantum networking at Oak Ridge National Lab. One week later, for a virtual lab tour at Google Quantum AI. This will be a fantastic virtual lab tour. So we are really excited to see you there. 
if you want to learn more, a little bit more in depth, what each of the hardwares is about, you can go to Canvas, to module three, quantum computer har computing hardware. And there you see a variety of quantum computing modalities. If you want to learn more about superconducting quantum computing, you go to this quiz and see a link to uh, a lecture already recorded where you will have one hour of content on, in this case, superconducting quantum computing. Same, we have one hour of content on silicon-based, photonic, neutral atom, trapped ions. You can do, and then do the quizzes and earn a certificate for it. This is a, an optional module in the program. We can imagine you're also quite busy with Q-Bronze, now Q-Cobalt on quantum annealing. Um, but if you're interested in learning more, this is the place to get started. Time to take a three minute break. At 45, we will continue with the next lecture. And to give a, a sneak preview, we just had a lecture on the basics of quantum hardware by Dan Slichter, physicist in the ion storage group at NIST. Soon, in three minutes, we will start the next lecture on quantum annealing, the basics and the hardware. Today is a hardware focus day by Berta Trulas-Clavera, a senior superconducting IC designer at D-Wave.